Father, we come to you and we're amazed that we in our brokenness and our unholiness in our human condition, that we can do what your scripture says, which is to boldly come before the throne of grace, that we might receive grace and mercy to help us in a time of need. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can come. And Father, we thank you that you're sovereign and irrepressible and inconceivable in your love. And I thank you, Lord, that we can just say to you that sometimes we don't see your love at work. Sometimes we look at this world that you're sovereign over and we wonder what in the world you're doing. And so I thank you, Lord, that we're not just left here to figure it out and speculate, but we can open your word. And you'll speak to us and you'll show us and you'll teach us things and you'll comfort us and you'll afflict us and you'll comfort us again so that we can know you, the only God worth knowing. Lord, I just pray for my friends tonight that are just really uncomfortable not being holy, that they would just come to their senses. And, and those that are just broken and scared in an unholy world with ungodly things happening, that they could be comforted and they would see and understand maybe in a way they never have. And they could sing the songs that I just sang with them with a heart that knows who you are, filled with grace, at peace with the God who is holy. Would you do all that tonight? Help us to serve you now in Jesus' name. Welcome. It is a a tender night to be with my friends at the porch. I mean, we are just hours on the backside of all of us once again just experiencing numbness because of what's happening in this world. And you all know that um, it's not just here in Dallas. We've got 19 plus locations around the country that tune in with us. And uh, one of them are our friends in El Paso. And so to my friends in El Paso that are watching, I want to let you know we have been praying for you. We are praying for you. We know that we in Dallas have a connection with you in the midst of this tragedy. That a young man from our communities um, made his way down to your town and brought terror. And we we know that um, we have another connection with you, and that is the God who's giving us comfort here and allowing us to intercede with you and for you is there with you as well. And so we love you guys, and we're praying, and we pray that tonight you would be comforted even as we're comforted, that we can comfort you with the comfort that we've been comforted. We have buried friends in this church who have died from mass shootings. And so we love you. It is a real privilege to to be with you. You guys know my name's Todd, and I I get to hang out with you guys here at the porch periodically and hang out here a lot. Um, And... Tonight, we're just going to talk a little bit about what in the world is going on. It, it, we're in the middle of a series called Jesus Walks. I was going to be with you tonight, and we're going to talk about um, an amazing moment in history, and uh, one that I would have loved to have been at. It was the Transfiguration, but there's another moment in history that I felt like we needed to deal with. When we start to think about um, Jesus walking 2,000 years ago, it's a, it's a fair and appropriate question just to ask, like, hey, what's a guy who lived and died 2,000 years ago got to do with me? What's a book that, that has been put together and hobbled together and preserved? What's it got to do with me? I mean, come on, Todd, come on, Christians. This is the real world we live in. I mean, I like Jesus as much as I know about him, but what's he got to do with me? I mean, how can Jesus relate to my world? Well, do you know that Jesus lived during a day where there was a random slaughter of innocents. Do you know that Jesus was confronted with the question about people who were senselessly killed anonymously as they were just going about, in fact, God's business. They weren't even shopping at Walmart. They weren't at school. They were going about what they thought they would do in serving God. Do you know that Jesus lived in a time where there was a mass murder by what appeared to be random actors killing people for no apparent reason. And it's in your Bible. Well, I'm going to show it to you tonight, and I think you're going to find some truth here. Jesus walked, and the Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that he, he walked on this earth. What an amazing thing about God. This is, this is one of the greatest sources of comfort for me. It says in Hebrews 4, 15, that we have a high priest, and we're talking about Jesus there. We have a high priest 
who can sympathize with our weakness, with our frailty, with our fear, because he has been tempted in all things, even as we have been tempted. He's been tempted to go, God, where are you? Have you forsaken me? I mean, do you know what you're doing? Are you asleep? He walked as man. He lived as man. Now, he did not commit sin. He was fully God and fully man. He never stopped being God when he was here on earth, but he chose to lay aside his sovereign ability to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and to walk as you and I walk, and to trust as you and I trust. And because he trusted perfectly, he was able to provide for us a means through which we can be reconciled to God. And so it says in Hebrews 4.16, a verse that I prayed before the rest of you jumped in with me, it says, therefore, let us draw near, because our high priest has made a sacrifice for us with his own body and his own blood, that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we're still sinners, Christ came, God came and died for us, therefore we can draw near. Now watch this, with confidence to the throne of grace. I am a sinful man but I can move boldly before a holy God that I can receive mercy and grace to help me in a time of need. And Jesus lived in a day when there was a random, senseless murder. Mass murder. That's a little Bible trivia. I'm pausing right here for a second. Anybody have any idea where I'm gonna turn? (laughs) I heard somebody screaming up top. That's it, we're gonna go there. Luke 13 in a moment. But before we get there, let me just do this. I just want to just spend some time just reminding ourselves of some things that are true. And let's just read some scripture together and let's just comfort ourselves. The, the scripture says in, in Psalm 34 that God is, is, he draws near to the brokenhearted and he saves those that are crushed in spirit. Now listen, there's going to be application for all of us tonight, okay? First of all, you need to know this. God will draw near to you as you are brokenhearted, not because circumstances around you seem scary, overwhelming, and out of control, but he draws near to you when you're brokenhearted over the out-of-control, scary sin that reigns in the hearts of everybody who doesn't know him. So just mark my word, this verse has dual application. It has application towards those of us who are grieving the loss of friends and loved ones in our community. But it's a verse that primarily and really also applies to those that have a broken and contrite spirit and they just go, God, I mean, you're holy and I don't know if I, if I can have a relationship with you and I'm, I, I want to because you're the only thing that can bring me comfort in times like this. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now, verse 19 is what really applies to us. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We're here and we're afflicted because we live in a world that is not the world that God intended. We live in a world that is infused with sin. We live in a world that is inhabited by men that, that aren't just sinners in their nature, but that remain sin in their nature. Now, all of us were born into sin. Some of us, by the kindness of God, have come to know the goodness of his way, and we begin now to walk with him, and instead of being darkness, we're light. Instead of being the source of decay, we're actually the source of preservation. We're salt. But we still live in a world that brings affliction to us. None of us are without sin. All of us in some way contribute to sadness at some level every day, but certainly when we come to know Christ as a transformation that happens and God changes our hearts and we become a source of hope and not a source of destruction. And, and, and the Lord will deliver us, though, it says in verse 19, out of all the affliction that we have one day. Let me just share with you a few verses that Jesus said to his disciples when he was getting ready to leave, okay? In John chapter 14, in verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. Now look, It doesn't look like a very peaceful world, does it? But Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My my peace, God says, I give to you. It's not the peace that the world's gonna give to you, but it's gonna be a different kind you're gonna find. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. What God's gonna offer us is something. It's it's an understanding of the sovereign, eternity-sweeping kindness and goodness of God, but he's gonna let you know that in this world, we're not 
there yet. So don't be surprised. In John 16, in the same little message, when he's talking to his troops, when he's talking to his team, and he says, we're going to go through this thing together. He said, I'm speaking all these things to you. And, he, and you ought to go read John 14, 15, and 16. He says, these things I've spoken to you so that you might have peace, so that when you have tribulation, you won't lose heart, you won't become uncourageous, you won't wilt, you won't um, go into the fetal position because you'll know that God's overcome the world and God has overcome the world, but the world that we're living right now has not yet met and understood and lived underneath the kindness and goodness of God. And when we don't live underneath the kindness and goodness of God, we've got all kinds of problems. I say all the time, when we as humans leave and don't have faith in and trust in the God who is goodness and kindness and light and life and love, you're going to get what you have when you leave that, which is darkness and hatred and death, and not love but murder. And Jesus says, look, I love you, but some of you guys are gonna be reconciled to me and I'm gonna leave you in this murderous world. And I want you to offer hope and, and grace and repentance and I want you to show strength in the midst of loss. And I want you to grieve, but not as those who grieve without hope. And so don't be surprised, this is earth. And just like God, when he came to earth, he suffered because the world doesn't receive him. When we start to understand who God is, we're not confused by these kind of events. But God says, let's go church, rise up, wake up. I wanna use you to stem the madness, to bring hope and to comfort those who are afflicted and don't understand what you're gonna understand if you hang in there with me tonight. Let's just remind ourselves of this truth as we get ready to look at how Jesus handled a mass murder and a random act of killing during his day and age. Psalm 46, though, says this, God is our refuge, and I have nothing to offer you tonight apart from my God. But because he is my refuge and he is my strength, I can stand before you and I can help you. Not because I'm older than you or wiser than you, but because the God who created you has given me and you a revelation. He's pulled back the veil and he said, quit speculating on philosophers. Quit saying you love wisdom. Listen to the God who is wisdom, who loves you, who is preserved for you truth. Let him be your strength. Scripture says, therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, and man, it's a changing, is it not? Though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake as swelling pride, the Walmarts become rippled with blood. Know this, there's another river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations will make an uproar. The kingdoms will totter. God will raise his voice one day and the earth will melt. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come behold the works of the Lord. Who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. There is no evil that will move on earth that God is not sovereign over. Cease trying to fix it by your gun control laws and by your philosophies and politics. There is one way to fix it. This is a problem of the human heart. I have been in a land where there was not a wide distribution of guns. It was called Rwanda. And just over two decades ago, about a million Rwandans died. The problem wasn't a broad distribution of guns. The problem was darkness had grown in their heart. This is a battle not against flesh and blood and not against manufacturers. This is a battle against the human condition apart from God. Over a million Rwandans were killed hand to hand with, with machetes and rocks and sticks in a hundred days. A million. See, striving to try and figure out how to fix this. God alone will be exalted among the nations and I'm gonna show you a little bit tonight about how Jesus handled questions that you might have been asked right now about what in the world is going on. But be sure the Lord of hosts is with us. 
the God of Jacob is our stronghold. It's called the God of Jacob because you can read the story of Jacob, who was a deceiver, who tried to live life apart from God, but God was determined to show him kindness, and eventually Jacob was wounded to the point where he walked with a limp, and then God restored him back into relationship with him, and God used that that pain to show him who he was. In the midst of that, Jacob then turned to God and trusted in him, and God was able to allow him to prosper in the midst of that relationship, not materially as much as with the strength of a heart that can be informed by the truth of who God is. He's a God with a resume. He's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go look at the way God treats murderers and liars and deceivers and have hope that maybe he can treat you the same way. If you got a Bible, and I hope you do, open it to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. There's an occasion that is going on here, and what Jesus is basically saying is, hey, look around you, um, take note of what's happening, and and make good decisions. He, in fact, uses um, simple truths about designs of nature and things that we see happen in nature with weather, right? You you haven't been um, alive very long before you hear little things that will help you understand, like red at night, sailors delight, but red in the morning, sailors take warning, right? You ever heard that? In other words, you can tell a little bit about what's coming on the horizon um, or or in the rest of the day by looking out just a little bit ahead and lifting your head up and and reading the signs of the times. And what Jesus is saying, that if you mistake the signs of the times, you're going to have troubled seas and you're not going to be prepared for it. And so he says, just before this little occasion, he says, I just want to warn you, you guys are smart enough to know that if you're going to go to a, a magistrate or go to a court and you think you might get prosecuted, that you do everything you can to kind of cut a deal. You do everything you can to um, plea bargain so that you won't execute a certain level of judgment. And in effect, in the context right before we're here, what Jesus is saying is, listen, people, you'll do whatever is necessary to stay out of jail. You might want to pay a little bit of attention and apply the same intentionality to stay out of hell. Because there is a sovereign judge who's greater than your human magistrates. And if you just watch what's going on, you'll see that he's here. That's Luke 12. And there's a day he's going to come, and you don't know when that day is. But avail yourself to the truth that's being revealed. And I say the same thing to you tonight. Avail yourself to this truth. So Luke 13. Now, on the same occasion, in other words, during this little dialogue that he's having, it says, on the same occasion, there, there were some present with him who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Okay, so let me explain this to you. There were some folks that were listening to Jesus, and they were, frankly, probably enemies of Christ. There were people that were trying to um, create problems for Jesus, and they knew if they confronted him with some things that were happening in that day, one of two things were going to happen. He was either going to look like he was pro-oppressor. The Romans had occupied Israel, and they were um, causing the Israelites to live in a time of great despair. That despair was highlighted recently by an attack that happened when Pilate had mingled some Galileans' blood with their sacrifices. All right, here's a little historical knowledge for you. We know from history that at some point that what Pilate did, because he was building some aqueducts. What's an aqueduct? We don't have aqueducts around here. That's right. We put pipes in the ground. An aqueduct is a way to carry water from one part of a land where there's plenty of it to another part of a land where there isn't one. And Pilate needed some funding for that, so he dipped into the temple treasury. People brought, if you will, their tithes and offerings to worship God, and Pilate said, hey, as the bully on the block, I'm going to say, we're not going to get new pews or new carpet. We're not going to get uh, you know, new instruments. We're not going to get new buildings. We're going to build an aqueduct for the Romans that are garrisoned here, making sure you're oppressed. And what had happened is when the Jews heard about this, they gathered together to protest, and when Pilate saw the protest, he sent some of his soldiers dressed in plain clothes amongst those particular people from Galilee who were protesting what he had done, and they started to randomly murder a number of Jews in the midst of their shouting and saying, Pilate's got to go. Let's get rid of Rome. They couldn't hear the screams of a number of them that were being shivved. And so at the temple where they offer the blood of sacrifices, many Jews had died. 
And so one of two things was gonna happen here based on how Jesus responded in this moment. It was either gonna allow the Jews to accuse him of being pro-Roman, or he was gonna defend the Jews and say what Pilate did was wrong, and they knew that that would make the Roman leaders go, we gotta get rid of this Jesus because he's gonna decide a riot. So Jesus is caught between a rock and a hard place here. First of all, he says he's God. He says God is love. God just let this crazy thing happen. And now what's he going to do? Is he going to be pro-Roman or pro-Jew? Now, I love what Jesus did because he answers typically with a question. That's what he does, right? They were kind of saying, hey, what do you make of this? And, um, you know, it's kind of like you know, if you watch Jesus, he's just a master. It's like a guy one time, you know, he said to me, hey, when I ask you a question, why do you always reply by asking me another one? And I said to that guy, well, why do you ask? kind of what Jesus did. He said, let me ask you a question before I give an answer. And here comes his question. He answered and said to them, do you suppose, or I got a question for you, do you suppose that these Galileans, now watch this, the ones that died in this random tragedy were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because those that died suffered this fate. So they were trying to make sense out of this. And and, and one of the things that happens sometimes in the midst of tragedy is um, people think, well, if evil has befallen you, there must be some reason it befell you, like it didn't befall me for that reason. And what Jesus is going to do is not answer their question. But he's going to keep the conversation he was in with them going. Now listen, I have not heard anybody, I haven't heard anybody say about the Walmart incident what I heard them sometimes say about the Pulse incident. You remember the Pulse incident in Orlando? 40 some odd people were killed just a few years ago. Do you remember that mass shooting? Do you remember what kind of bar went down? What that shooting was, what was it? It was a gay bar. And I heard some people say, well, there you go, it's God judgment. you're gonna see that that just won't stand. I haven't heard anybody say, well, you should shop at Walmart, there you go. How crazy is that? Now listen to me. He says, do you really suppose that that can be your out? Do you suppose the Galileans were greater sinners than all the other ones because they suffered this fate, because their bloods were, were mingled? No, I tell you, watch verse three, I tell you, unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. What's he talking about? Let me just read a couple more verses because he's not done. He goes, let's just add something else. Do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? Because there were some people that were building a tower, right? That's what you did. You'd build places for outlooks and and watchdogs to be in. And they'd be up there. They were building a tower for use in the city. And in the midst of that construction, as often happens in construction, especially ancient construction, um, the walls fell and 18 people were killed. He goes, do you think those 18 people died because they were the most wicked 18 people in Siloam? Is that why they died? Watch what Jesus says about this. He says, I say to you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Let me just say a few things I think that are obvious to this crowd, but and start with this. Human tragedies are not always divine punishments, right? Human tragedies are not always divine punishments. You don't, you don't get out of human tragedies because of your faith. If you have a tragedy of cancer, if you have the tragedy of some birth defect, if you have the, the, the tragedy of, um, of great sorrow in your life that was thrown upon you, it's not always because of what you have done. Otherwise, how do you explain all the suffering of the prophets? How do you explain the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? How do you explain the Parkinson of Billy Graham? No, tragedy is not always a result of divine punishment, but I will tell you that things that happen in this world that are not heavenly, that are not kingdom things, happen because we live in a world that is not yet his kingdom. Now, a number of God's kingdom people are here. Well, Todd, who are they? Those are folks who are brokenhearted and contrite about their own sin. 
They have what's called godly sorrow. They're not filled with worldly sorrow, like, what are we gonna do? Look at all that's going on around us, it's not right. How can we stop this from happening? And God says, well, here's how you can stop it from happening. Let my kingdom come. On earth as it is in heaven, because there's been those mass shootings in heaven. There's been no lack of peace in heaven. There is no paralyzing diseases in heaven. There is no birth defect in heaven. There is no tear in heaven. But I just want to say this. This is so amazing. Heaven has shed tears on earth. Before I unpack this for you right here, I just want to tell you, this is what Jesus would do if he was in El Paso right now. It's what we're doing right now. He would weep with those who weep. He would mourn with those who mourn. When Jesus moved, where sin had reigned, if you will, in the life of his friend Lazarus and Mary and Martha, Jesus wept. When Jesus looked at the chaos and the dead religion that ruled his day, he spoke over Jerusalem and he wept. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, Dallas, Dallas, oh, El Paso, oh, Joplin, oh, Houston. How I long for you to know me and for you to be a source of my grace and kindness and hope and redemption in the world that you live in. I can make provision for all of your sin. Don't look at the sin of mass murderers and terrorists. Deal with the brokenness in your own life. Don't be surprised when there's chaos and trouble among you. There's always going to be. Jesus said to his disciples, the poor are always going to be with you. Racists are always going to be with us. Idiot white supremacists will always be with us. And Jesus says, just don't be one of them. Do what you can to help the poor and do what you can do to help people, those poor people that are trapped in the lostness of their clouded eye and broken worldview. Be a source of the grace. And he says just repent. Repentance is a word that we have a hard time with, but repentance always starts with knowledge of sin. You see what Jesus did right here? Hey, you guys want me to throw Pilate under the bus? And Pilate's gonna get thrown under the bus. Mark my word. But he just says this. You better repent or you will likewise perish that those that died under Pilate's hand. And he says, you better repent or you will die like those who were just going to work and died while they were at work. And so what's it mean you too will likewise perish when the people that he's talking about were randomly killed in the Walmarts of his day or were just going to work to provide for their families and they died? Here's the answer. If you don't deal with your sin, which separates you from God, if you don't deal with your sin that separates you from God, you will likewise perish like those individuals. Number one, you will die in judgment under judgment from one who is in authority. Now, Pilate was abusive in his authority and was abusive in his judgment, but Jesus just got through telling a story like, look, there is a judge and he is coming and he will recompense men according to his deeds and it's gonna happen suddenly and you better be ready because you will meet a judge and he's a righteous judge. And the way you think you get you know, um, reconciled to me through your own works or your dead religion, you're wrong. You get reconciled to me by being broken hearted and crushed in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Let me ask you a question this week. When you've been looking at the ravages of sin in your world, have you looked in a mirror and seen the sin that's ravaged your own life? You know, when people say, like, man, why doesn't God stop this stuff? Uh, you guys know I do something called Real Truth Real Quick. I, I did a Real Truth Real Quick a while ago called Why Doesn't God Stop Terrorism and Mass Shootings? And one of the things I said the night, I did it right after the Pulse murders, which was the largest mass murder um, in American history at the time. And one of the things I just said is, let me ask you a question. How many people outside of that nightclub in America that night do you think were, were looking at porn? How many people in the room that were here right now were sleeping with somebody that night? How many of us had arrogant ideas about our own self-righteousness or had some sense of superiority over others? Because guys, that's evil. And when we talk about what God should judge, most of us think about evil and we define evil as 
anything that doesn't please us. That's not the way God defines evil. Uh, a guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who lived underneath Stalin's oppressive, murderous regime, killed, killed millions of people in Russia. He had put in the Gulag Archipelago, which is in the northern part of Siberia. And while he was there, he wrote an amazing work. And one of the things he said is this, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy those evil people. What he wasn't saying there is, hey, there's really no evil people. What he's saying is, if only evil was in them. And while Solzhenitsyn may not have been part of a, a murderous communist worldview and power structure, he knew that that same sin which led Stalin to do what he did was in him. And he repented. He took Jesus' message and he said just for a second, he says, I'm gonna meet a righteous judge one day. And I wanna be ready. What does Jesus mean when he says, if you don't repent, you will likewise perish? He means you're gonna die in judgment one day under somebody who has authority over you. Secondly, he meant you're going to die someday, probably most of us without time to prepare for our death. Death doesn't usually call you and say, hey, next week, it's a guy who's gonna just kinda of cross that dotted line and he's gonna clip your car and you're going home. Death doesn't usually come with hours in a hospital bed. It's why it's a really bad idea for this room to go, I'm 20, death isn't gonna come to me. Have you read the biographies of those who have been dying? It's your generation. And I'm not just trying to scare you, I'm just trying to tell you, Jesus says, listen, man, you guys gotta be, you gotta be ready because you don't know when this is gonna happen. When Jesus says, if you don't repent, you likewise will perish, what he's saying is two things. You're gonna die in judgment from somebody under authority, which is him, and secondly, you're gonna die without time to prepare yourself. James 4, 13 through 16, come now you who say today or tomorrow, we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You just go to Walmart because it's tax-free weekend. You go grocery shopping for your mom. Have you read the stories? Instead, you ought to see if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But as it is, your boast and your arrogance, all your boasting is evil. Repentance always starts with the knowledge of sin. It always goes on to create a sorrow for sin, not for circumstances. Can I just say this to you? Guys, it, it, you're not repenting if you're not aware of your own sin. You're not repenting if you don't have deep, heartfelt, brokenhearted sorrow for your sin. It always leads to confession of God, of you being nothing like him. It always shows itself before men by a growing, breaking of kinship with sin. Repentance changes playmates and it changes playgrounds. Repentance is not just you change your idea that Jesus' story is true and you used to think it was false. Repentance always produces a result. I will show that to you here before the day is over. Let me just give you a couple more applications from what we've just read before I show you that final, that final point. And that is just simply this. What I'm doing right here, guy, I'm just trying to help you in the midst of what's going on to let you know what's going on. And in a very sad, very difficult way, I would tell you that times of suffering are sometimes sovereignly allowed by God to bring truth to light. Times of suffering are sometimes allowed by God to bring truth to light. And man, there's been some truth that's been brought to light, hasn't there been? Like, man, something's wrong. Life can end suddenly. And I'm gonna ask you, are you going to deal with those realities? And what's gonna be your solution? And I'm gonna tell you, cease striving, man. And you better know that he is God. A guy named C.S. Lewis, if you hang around circles like this, you're gonna hear his name quoted because he thought a lot. He used to not believe in God for a long time. 
And then he came to a place where he was, had knowledge of his own sin. He said this, we can, we can ignore God even in our pleasure. But pain, pain is different. Pain insists upon being attended to. Right? You guys had that? The pain of not being ready for a test. The pain of being fired from a job. The pain of loving somebody and not having it reciprocated. The pain of having your mom and dad not love each other anymore. The pain of growing up under a godless generation ahead of you. The pain of being in a world that is um, just devolving into greater and greater chaos. The pain of a mass murderer in your town. But pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. I mean, one of the things that pleasures are is, is a little hint of heaven. And God wants you to know he's a good and kind and gracious God, and he created you to, to enjoy him. And, and there, there is a shadow of the goodness that's all around us. He speaks in our consciousness. He, he does that, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to raise and rouse a deaf world. And you would do well to pay attention. This is not to say that evil is good. Evil is not good. But we can make sense of evil events. These, these evil things are senseless acts. Sin never makes sense. It takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you more than you want to pay. You know, they're talking to this kid that, that went to Plano High School right here in our town. Members of our church went to school with this kid. And maybe they loved him. Maybe they invited him to come hang out with us. He's your peer right here in your area. You could have met him if you were in Allen. You could have loved him. You could have seen his loneliness. You could have said, hey, there's this thing called the porch. There's this church called Watermark. There's this church where you're going to where disciples are made. And you could have loved him. You could have reached out to him. You could have been a source of healing in his heart. You could have been, uh, he might have suppressed it. He might have rejected it. He might have been committed to his sin. But this is a kid that was hurting. This kid, they say they can't even interview yet. He's still in shock. He doesn't even know what he did. Evil does that to you. You ever felt like that? Who am I? Well, if you don't know Jesus and you haven't got to that place yet, you haven't repented, and you just wait. Because it gets ugly. And Jesus is saying, come here, man. I can explain the evil that happened in that kid's heart. Can you deal with the evil that's in yours? I'm the source of your evil. Times of suffering are, are sovereignly allowed by God to bring truth to light. I just want to stick this in there because some people might say, Todd, where was God? Where was God when this happened? And I would just say he was identifying with us in our suffering. He has suffered. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is, he is interceding for us in the heavens. That's where he is. He's before the Father. And I got to believe, I just got to tell you, I'll stick this in right here. One of my favorite places in Scripture. I love it when Jesus just kind of pulls back the veil. Like Pilate is, you know, having the crap beat out of him. He's, he's mingling Jesus' blood right? And he just says, hey man, don't you know who I am? And Jesus just grabs him by the throat and he brings him down. I, this, is, this is a little extra biblical, but I think it happened. <laughs> I mean, he's beaten, he's whipped, he's tortured, and Pilate knows he's not guilty. And Pilate says, man, speak up. Who are you and what are you doing? Don't you know who I am? And Jesus said, I know exactly who you are. The question is, do you know who I am? If you knew who I was, you would go out there and tell him, you're not going to have anything to do with my crucifixion, but you're a coward. You don't love God. You love you, so you're going to appease the people. You're not going to have a good tomorrow. Let's him go. I, I, I had other words in my head. That's why I stuttered there. I, <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have said what I was thinking. I would have said in that moment. And there's another time, you know, Jesus is crucified, he's resurrected, he, he reveals himself to the world and he's ascended, he's sitting at the right hand of God and then, and then one of his boys, Stephen, Stephen, who loves God, testifies. Unlike Pilate was willing to face a mob of Jews, Stephen did, he just said, let me just tell you who Jesus was. You crucified him, you killed him, he was God's provision. He's the Messiah and they stoned Stephen to death and it says he looked up into the heavens and he saw Jesus. What was Jesus doing? Wasn't working a rosary, wasn't praying to Mary. 
He wasn't interceding before the Father. Anybody remember what Jesus was doing? He was standing. Again, now here's my little extra biblical uh, moment, right? So I'm a, I'm a child of the 70s, uh, 60s, and, and whatnot, and so, you know, you ever watch the Flintstones, right? Make a little nod, right? Whenever Barney and Fred would get ready to run, what would they always do? They'd always go, the little legs would do that, they'd make that little sound, right? I gotta believe, and this is, again, not in your Bible, it's just in mine, okay? And I believe Jesus saw what was going on, that he saw his children suffering in that world that he knew was gonna be racked with trouble. He saw one of his sheep being tortured by sinful men. I think he said, done interceding, let's go. Let's roll back the clouds like a scroll. Let's go get them right now, Dad. And I think he said, I'm going, blah, 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 like that. And the father was like, not yet, son, not yet, not yet. But your Jesus knows all about your Walmart, man. He knows all about your parents. He knows all about all the hardship that's happened to you. He knows about the hardness of your own heart, and he loves you. And the scripture says in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says that God is not slow, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, wishing that none should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. So what's another application? Here it is. Judgment is certain. You just need to know judgment is certain. Jesus said as much. Right? You're going to likewise perish under a sovereign over you who will judge. Inasmuch it's appointed, the scripture says, for men, in Hebrews 9, 27, for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. I just tell people all the time, you know, um, what's the death rate in your city? The answer is one apiece. That's the death rate. Everybody that is born dies. People are dying every day who have never died before. And the scripture says that God is patient towards you. But you need to know this. There's going to be a place and a time where if you've not yet started praying, it won't matter if you do. Can I just say that to you again? There's going to be a time and a place where if you haven't already been praying, and I'm not talking about when you hear pop, 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 pop in your school, in your church, in your Walmart, that he won't deliver you. I'm talking about there is a time when, when the, in the flood, this is, well, just, I'll give it to you, Psalm 32, 6. It says, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to him in a time when he may be found. Because surely in a flood of great waters, you will not reach him. There is often a second chance. But there is always a last chance, people. God has offered Forgiveness to your repentance. He has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. He just hasn't. And unless you too repent, man, you know, you might just go to work faithfully tomorrow and the tower may fall on you. You're gonna die just like them in Siloam. Quickly, without a chance to deal with your sin. So don't just live it up in your 20s. Don't give your 20s to the devil. Don't just say, I'm gonna get after it, and then later I'm gonna find a good girl, and we're gonna settle down, and then I'll start to go to church. That's a bad plan. That might have been the plan of our brother in Plano who drove 10 hours to El Paso. Sin will take you farther than you wanna go. It'll keep you longer than you wanna stay, and it'll cost you more than you wanna pay. And sometimes, man, there ain't no getting out, and you just don't even know where it came from. Jesus closes this little story in Luke 13 by saying this. It's interesting, there's a shift here. In verse six, he says, he began telling this parable. A certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it. He did not, he didn't find any fruit. And he said to the vine keeper, behold, for three years, I've, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, three years. And without finding any, cut it down. Why does it even use up this ground? And, and the vine keeper said, to him, let it alone, sir, just, just for this year too, until I dig around it and put fertilizer in it. And, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. Let me encourage it. Let me, let me give it nourishment. Let me give it a couple of more porches. But if not, cut it down. I mean, one of the things that I just see when I, when I look at this is, is that, first of all, what Jesus does is he, he, he ties 
the fruitfulness of the fig tree to a story about repentance. And I want you to hear this. I, I, I think you heard me say it already. Repentance, guys, is not just a change of mind. It's a change of mind that always results in a change of action. That's why this story is here. Some of you at the porch have embraced the idea of Jesus. You might even have shed a little tear one night when you've been especially moved about your sin and God's kindness towards you. You've got knowledge of sin, you've got sorrow for sin, you've got confession of sin before God. But this story is here for you because in addition to your confession of sin before God, there, there's got to be and there will be, if, if you have a relationship with God, a breaking off from sin. Not perfectly, we're not perfect, but, but God, if he has not changed your appetites, if you can still sin with the same ease, if you can say, well, this is just the sin that God gave me and I don't need to deal with it, I don't need to change it, I'm telling you, that's a problem. And you might be planted in this little vineyard right here and think that you're doing fine, but there's no fruit on it. There will be a cutting down. If you have not in your life have an increasing production of a, a habit of deep hatred for all sin. First of all, what are you looking forward to in heaven? People who have a love for sin will not look forward to heaven. Look forward to being with God. No, they will shrink back at his coming the same way a dead tree is sucking nutrients out of a ground where God expects there to be produce. What you see here in just a little application is just this, and that is if our roots are buried deep in the soil of God's word, then God's fruit should and where and will bear evidence in our life. Let me just say this. You are not saved because of these works that you do. No, we are saved by grace through faith alone. But the faith which saves is never alone. It's never alone. One of the greatest assurances I have that I really know Jesus, and I still sin, guys, but when I sin, I hate it. When I see anger in me that rules me, when I see lust that, that is attractive to me and I wanna give myself to it, I take that second look, I, 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 I wanna look and hit the click, I wanna move there, I wanna make an excuse for watching a movie, I hate it, I hate it, I wish it wasn't in me. I pray that God would remove it, and he says, Todd, my grace is sufficient for you. What you gotta decide right now, are you gonna follow your flesh or are you gonna live by faith? The life which I live right now is still inside a flesh that longs for all the sin it's always longed for. But I, by God's kindness, I know I've been crucified with Christ and the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. One of the greatest assurances I have that I know Jesus is that when I sin, I hate it. I confess it. I forsake it. I tell friends, hey, we gotta do something, man. I can't just say I can handle this being in my house. I gotta get rid of it because I don't want it to have access. I wanna abstain from these fleshly lusts and I'm moving on it and not just saying I know about a cross. I pick it up and I follow him. What do we have tonight? We have this, just very simple truths. The need for repentance, friends, is clear. It's clear. The time for repentance is now. The evidence of repentance is fruit. It's a changed life. You're not saved because your life changes. Your life has been changed by the power and the grace of God. Let me just read you this last little thing by Lewis and we close and it's just what's going on in our world. I just, our world is so confused. What do we do? Is it the Republicans' fault? Is it our president's fault? Is it the gun manufacturer's fault? Is it mental health system's fault? Here's what's going on. We have a world that still strives to make sense out of the broken human condition without God. We have stopped teaching ethics and values and morals and repentance in schools. We have shattered the family unit. We don't hold young men accountable. We let them isolate and live alone, and I'm not blaming video games, but we put them in a room filled with despair where they live imaginary lives and they practice desensitizing themselves to other humans. We celebrate it. We make excuses for it. We enable them with medication. 
and we don't do what Jesus did. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, I'm quoting Lewis now, we remove the organ and we demand the function. We take the heart out and we expect goodness to circulate. We make men without chess, men without honor, and we expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and we shock then to find traitors in our midst. We castrate the gelding and we bid it to be fruitful. That is a very illustrative saying. And we are neutering ourselves with our godlessness and our refusal to be brokenhearted over our sin. What America does in moments like this is we cry, we pray, it's appropriate, but it's a worldly sorrow. We want the circumstances to stop. We deal with the symptoms and we don't deal with the problem. And the problem is in us, it is sin. Cease striving in a way that seems right to men. Come to God. Father, I thank you that you have walked with us in the fire of earth, that you have been tempted in every way as we have been. You have had Walmarts. You've had innocent blood mingled in a random way. And you took it and you used it to remind us of why blood is mingled on this earth because it's not heaven. It's not what you meant to happen on earth. You wanted men to, 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 to know you and to walk with you and to trust you and to love one another and to live faithfully. But we said, we don't need you, God. We don't need your love. We don't need your light. And so we have gotten hatred and we have gotten darkness and we have gotten death. But I thank you in the midst of the death that's in this world, there has been another in the fire and he did not sin. And he loved us enough to go to a cross and to have his body broken and his blood shed. The eternal son of God, the very visible image, the inconceivable love of God was revealed in Jesus. And when we are brokenhearted over our sin and poor in spirit, we can lift our eyes up and we can see your provision on the cross and we can trust in you and we can say, I wanna follow that love. God, thank you for making a way that I, unholy Todd, can come to a holy God boldly and receive grace and mercy in my time of need as can everybody in this room. Everybody listening. And I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here who just goes, yep, yeah, yeah, Todd, that's me. I, I know sin's in me. I see sin in the world, and I'm gonna deal with the sin in my world, and I'm gonna confess it. I'm gonna be brokenhearted about it, and I'm gonna forsake it, and I'm gonna learn to follow God. I'm gonna love God and his people and his word. I'm not gonna isolate any longer. And this is the day, Lord, that your patience has allowed for, that I should not perish, but I come to you in repentance. And if that's you, you just say in this moment, God, I come to you, I confess my sin, I see your kindness, I see your love, I see that you're a God that's walked on an earth filled with insecurity and trouble, and you've given us peace. We have faith, and that gives us peace with God. And so, Lord, I have confidence that Jesus is your provision for me. And I put my faith in him and not in my own works, righteousness, or not in my own plans to stem evil in this world. I trust you. And I know, Lord, there's going to be a day when you're going to deal with evil completely. And I thank you that you're dealing with my evil now by grace. And so, Lord, let your spirit be loud in my life. Give me an affection for you and a love for you. Thank you for rooms filled with God's people, that I can now run to them and say, teach me more of my Father, that I can walk in the kindness and goodness of his way. Thank you that you are a high priest who can sympathize with my weakness, that you have been through this fire, and you will never leave me or forsake me, that you stand ready to come when the Father says, go. But Lord, if you tarry, may we be about your business now, loving broken people in our Allens before they get in cars and drive to someone else's El Paso. Let us bear fruit. Let us be your people. Let us walk with courage in the fire. In Jesus' name.